Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. Here we will take up the news articles from the Hindu Delhi edition and discuss them as per the demands of UPSC Civil Services exam. The topics for today's discussion are listed on your screen. Let us begin our discussion. The first article of today's discussion is based on this news which featured at page number 12 in the Hindu. It basically talks about the militancy issue in Jammu and Kashmir. And the context is that militants in Peer Panjal Valley are changing their tactics to outsmart security forces in order to survive in the difficult terrain. And these militants are using advanced technologies to communicate secretly and are taking advantage of divided families. The topic of militancy comes under terrorism which is relevant for General Studies Paper 3 as internal security is mentioned in the syllabus of General Studies Paper 3 and specifically the role of external state and non-state actors. In today's session, we will discuss about terrorism, its causes, its classification and then we will specifically focus on the militancy issue of Jammu and Kashmir and then we will focus to a specific issue of militancy in Jammu and Kashmir and the steps taken by government to counter militancy in Jammu and Kashmir. Terrorism is an important and recurring theme in UPSC mains exam. As you can see, in the year 2019, two questions have been asked on terrorism. The first one is related to the role of overground workers in Jammu and Kashmir and the second related to anti-terrorism laws. And in the year 2021, UPSC again asked two questions on terrorism. The first one is related to external state and non-state actors which is directly mentioned in the syllabus and the next question was asked on causes of terrorism. From these questions, you must be getting an idea that it is an important topic for civil services mains exam. Now the first thing which comes to your mind is what the terrorism is. Terrorism is a deliberate and organized use of violence to instill fear in the population and to achieve specific political goals. Further, it also involves unlawful acts or threats of violence to target innocent people with the intention of promoting political or religious agendas. Whenever you come across a question related to terrorism, you can start your answer with this particular definition. Now we will try to analyze the causes behind terrorism in India. These are the major four causes behind terrorism. And the first one is political grievances. The inadequate representation of certain sections of society in the state legislature results into the rise of militant organizations in areas like Kashmir. And in order to find solutions to their problems, many people tend to join these organizations. And on the other hand, the problem of Naxalism which is predominantly an issue in central and eastern part of India is fueled by the socio-economic and political grievances of marginalized groups who are way behind in the development indicators. The next one is socio-economic disparities. The presence of economic disparities characterized by poverty and unequal wealth distribution plays a significant role in the escalation of activities like terrorism. Further. Insufficient employment prospects, particularly among youth, can render them susceptible to extremist ideologies, which is happening in the areas of Northeast. And exploiting the socio-economic grievances of individuals, the terrorist groups have been successful in recruiting the disenchanted youth. It is one of the important causes behind terrorism. The next one is communal and religious tensions. The instances of communal violence have been a catalyst for terrorist activities exemplifying the impact of tensions between religious groups. And the 1992 Bombay blasts was perpetrated by extremist organizations in response to religious clashes. You can quote such examples while writing answer on terrorism. And further, the presence of radical religious ideologies and the influence of extremist groups have been instrumental in driving individuals towards the acts of terrorism. And the last one is separatist movements. The different regions in Northeast India like Assam, Manipur and Nagaland have witnessed the emergence of separatist movement in order to achieve autonomy 
or independence to achieve their political goals and similarly during 1980s the demand for separate sikh homeland known as khalistan was resulted in a wave of violence and terrorism is often attributed to the groups like babbar khalsa here we have discussed the major causes behind terrorism in india to take forward our discussion let us see how the terrorism can be classified the first one is terrorism by external state actors the phenomena of terrorism by external state actors occurs when a government either directly or indirectly engages in an act of terrorism against the people of another country and the best example in this particular case is kashmir where the terrorism is widely regarded as a direct manifestation of pakistan's state policy and further the concerns have been raised regarding the potential involvement of bangladesh and myanmar as external state actors in relation to the activities in northeast region the second one is terrorism by non state actors it refers to the acts perpetrated by individuals or group that operate independently and are not affiliated or financially supported by any government the classic example to this is naxalism and the northeast insurgency now there is a four type of categorization of terrorism in india the first one is hinterland terrorism the second one is jammu and kashmir militancy the third one is northeast insurgency and the fourth one is left wing extremism these all comes under terrorism and today we will try to specifically focus on jammu kashmir militancy now to understand the militancy issue in jammu and kashmir we need to understand the background of this particular region the roots of militancy in jammu and kashmir can be traced back to 1940s when pakistan attacked india in order to capture the region of jammu and kashmir so it is one of the important cause behind the militancy in jammu and kashmir support from the certain section of society there has always been a group of people in jammu and kashmir who believe in separating from india and these groups supported from across border and have frequently engaged in insurgent activities the third one infiltration across border during 1980s there was a significant increase in infiltration across border which leads to sudden surge in insurgency and the innocent people were targeted and many were forced to leave the state and the next one is fundamentalism the rise of islamist fundamentalism and the emergence of groups like al qaeda have contributed to the militancy in jammu and kashmir and the organizations like let which is based in pakistan is believed to be inspired by the philosophy and ideology of al qaeda it was a brief discussion on the background of militancy in jammu and kashmir now we will discuss what is the situation at present the north kashmir which was once the hotbed of terrorism has seen little violence in recent year and the epicenter of terrorism started to shift towards south kashmir further the level of violence has reduced in kashmir valley further the infiltration across border has further reduced due to the efforts of indian government and the security forces which are deployed there and the next one is about recruitment the number of terrorists which were recruited in 2022 are way less than the recruitment which happened in 2021 from this particular slide you must be getting an idea that situation is improving in jammu and kashmir the next question which comes to our mind is the strategic shift in the militancy jammu and kashmir the missing of senior leadership and due to that there are lack of trained leaders who can handle the planning execution recruitment and other aspects of terror operations due to this particular phenomena there is a strategic shift which we are witnessing in jammu and kashmir the next one is recruitment in present time the recruitment is being seen among school dropouts in adolescent age and in contrast to that earlier the recruitment would be in the age of 25 to 30 years which was specifically focusing on the unemployed youth and now it has unfortunately shifted to a younger demography the terror activities in shrinagar are conducted by the foreign militants who are based in pakistan and these terrorists will get in touch with the overground workers and these terrorists will get in touch 
विद द ओवरग्राउंड वर्कर्स इन जम्मू एंड कश्मीर एंड दीज ओवरग्राउंड वर्कर्स वुड अरेंज लॉजिस्टिक्स टू कैरी आउट द एक्टिविटीज एंड यू पी एस ई इन ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन स्पेसिफिकली आस अ क्वेश्चन ऑन ओवरग्राउंड वर्कर्स एंड द नेक्स्ट वन इज रिवाइवल ऑफ मिलिटेंसी टेरर ग्रुप्स आर ट्राइंग टू रिवाइव मिलिटेंसी इन एरियाज दैट हैव बीन फ्री ऑफ सच एक्टिविटीज लाइक रियासी एंड डोडा एंड दे आर ट्राइंग टू शो प्रेजेंस एंड एंगेज कार्डर्स टू कैरी आउट टेरर एक्टिविटीज एंड द नेक्स्ट शिफ्ट वॉज इन द यूज ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी ड्रोन्स आर बींग यूज टू कैरी वेपन्स एंड कैश फर्दर द यंग पर्सनस हु हैव क्रॉस बॉर्डर टू रिसीव ट्रेनिंग इन पाकिस्तान एंड डिड नॉट कम बैक आर बींग एंगेज एज टेरर हैंडलर्स फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान टेरेटरी फर्दर वॉट चेंजेस दिस स्ट्रेटेजिक शिफ्ट ब्रॉड टू मिलिटेंसी इन कश्मीर द न्यू फेस ऑफ मिलिटेंसी इन कश्मीर स्टार्टेड इन ट्वेंटी फोर्टीन एंड द रीजन्स फॉर दैट फर्स्टली देर इज अ इंक्रीज एक्सेस टू सोशल मीडिया बाई पीपल इन द वैली एंड इट हैज फेसिलिटेटेड द मास रेडिकलाइजेशन एंड द स्प्रेड ऑफ एंटी इंडिया प्रोपेगेंडा अमंग कश्मीरी यूथ द सोशल मीडिया गेव मिलिटेंट्स द न्यू चैनल्स टू शो केस देयर ग्रीवांस एंड पोलिटिकल एस्पिरेशन एंड थ्रू दैट एंटी इंडिया नेरेटिव ग्रू स्ट्रॉगर एंड एलिनेशन हैज हाइट एंड इट ऑल्सो हेल्प इन रिक्रूटमेंट ऑफ पीपल थ्रू सोशल मीडिया फर्दर देर इज एन इंक्रीजिंग नंबर ऑफ लोकल कश्मीरीज हु टर्न टू मिलिटेंसी एंड स्टार्टेड सपोर्टिंग एंड पार्टिसिपेटिंग इन टेररिस्ट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन दैट हैड प्रीवियसली रिक्रूटेड ओनली पाकिस्तानी एंड अदर फॉरन मिलिटेंट्स हैंस इट इज एन इम्पॉर्टेंट एलिमेंट इन द न्यू फेस ऑफ मिलिटेंसी इन कश्मीर व्हाट्सएप एंड टेलीग्राम which has helped militants to mobilize crowds and they also served as channels for training local militants and briefing them on weapons explosive devices and the actual conduct of attacks hence these are the four important areas of the new face of militancy in kashmir the steps taken by government to counter militancy in jammu and kashmir the first one here is Prime Minister's Development Package of 2015 it focuses on development of infrastructure in the region which includes roads power school etc which invariably plays an important role in the development of Jammu and Kashmir the next one is project udan it focuses on skill development of youth of Jammu and Kashmir who are graduates and post graduates which will improve the prospects of employment and bring prosperity in the region the next one is appointment of government of india representative mr dineshwar sharma was appointed as representative of government to initiate and carry forward a dialogue with elected representatives various organizations and concerned individuals in the state of jammu and kashmir the next one is project ummeed which primarily focuses on women empowerment through skill development and self help groups and the last one is operation sadbhavna it is also referred to as operation goodwill which has been launched in jammu and kashmir by indian army which aimed at winning the hearts and minds of the people in the region before concluding our discussion we will quickly discuss the legal framework to counter terrorism in india the first act which is mentioned here is tada terrorist and disruptive activities prevention act it came in the background of punjab insurgency and was applied to whole of india it was the first anti terrorism law legislated by government to define and counter terrorist activities the next one is pota prevention of terrorism act it was enacted by parliament in 2002 due to several attacks that took place in india especially the attack of 2001 on parliament and the last one is uapa on which a direct question was asked in 2019 unlawful activities prevention act provides for more effective prevention of certain unlawful activities of individual and associations who are dealing with terrorist activities this law allows center to declare that a group is unlawful association or a terrorist organization and make the membership or support of that group a crime a quick recap to our discussion first of all we have discussed the context and its relevance for the general studies paper 3 in which internal security is an important sub theme we have also seen the questions which appeared in upsc mains exam we have discussed what the terrorism is the causes of terrorism 
its classification, the categorization of terrorism in India. Further, we shifted our focus to, to Jammu Kashmir militancy and the situation of Kashmir at present, the strategic shift in militancy, the new face of militancy in Kashmir, the steps taken by government and the legal framework to counter terrorism. After discussing the different aspects of terrorism and militancy, I hope that you will be able to write a decent answer to these questions. Moving on to the next topic, which is based on this news, which featured on page number 13 in The Hindu. It basically talks about the appointment of Supreme Court judges. It basically talks about the appointment of Supreme Court judges. And the context is that the Supreme Court Collegium, which is headed by Chief Justice of India, which recommended the appointment of Andhra Pradesh High Court Chief Justice and Senior Advocate as Judges of Supreme Court. The appointment of judges is an important topic for prelims as well as mains. In General Studies Paper 2, a subsection is mentioned in which the structure, organization and functioning of executive and judiciary is there. And in 2017, a question was asked on the appointment of judges of higher judiciary in India in the context of National Judicial Appointment Commission 2014. And in 2019, a question in prelims was asked regarding the judges of Supreme Court. We will discuss this question after the discussion. Now let us try to understand the procedure of appointment of judges to the Supreme Court. The appointment of judges comes under the Article 124 of the Indian Constitution and the judges of Supreme Court are appointed by President of India. Further, the Chief Justice of India is appointed by President after the consultation with such judges of Supreme Court and High Court as he deems necessary. And for other judges of Supreme Court, they are also appointed by President after the consultation with Chief Justice of India and the other judges of Supreme Court and High Court as he deems necessary. You should note down that the consultation of Chief Justice is obligatory in case of appointment of a judge other than the Chief Justice. Just try to remember this piece of information as it can be helpful in the prelims exam also. Here we have attached the screenshot of the Article 124 of Indian Constitution. It talks about the establishment and constitution of Supreme Court and it says there shall be a Supreme Court of India consisting of Chief Justice of India and until Parliament by law prescribes a larger number of not more than seven other judges. Every judge of Supreme Court shall be appointed by President of India by warrant under his hand and seal and shall hold office until he attains the age of 65 years. Now we will see the qualifications which are required for appointment of judge to the Supreme Court. The Constitution of India has prescribed certain qualifications. The first one is he should be the citizen of India and the second one he should have been the judge of high court for 5 years. He should have been the advocate of high court for 10 years. Or he should be a distinguished jurist in the opinion of president. These are the qualifications which are mentioned in the constitution. And from this, it is clear that the constitution has not prescribed a minimum age for the appointment as judge of supreme court. Just try to remember these qualifications as they are directly mentioned in the Constitution of India. In the introductory remark, we were talking about the Supreme Court Collegium, which is headed by Chief Justice of India. Now we will try to understand what is Collegium. The Collegium is one where CGI, that means the Chief Justice of India, and a forum of four senior most judges of Supreme Court recommend appointment and transfer of judges of higher judiciary. Just try to remember this, the transfer of judges is also done by the collegium. And the collegium system evolved through three different judgments which are collectively known as three judges case. And now the recommendations of collegium have been made public on the website of Supreme Court including the reasons for appointment or transfer. It was done to bring transparency in the process of appointment and transfer. Now we will quickly see the three judges case. The first judges case SP Gupta versus Union of India 1982. In this Supreme Court held the opinion of Chief Justice of India and the Chief Justice of High Courts were merely consultative and the power of appointment 
resides solely and exclusively with center government hence it is clearly stated that the power to appoint judges exclusively resides with center government and center government could override the opinions given by judges and the opinion of chief justice of india in the matters of appointment was not given primacy in the matters of judicial appointments under article 217 clause 1 further in second judges case supreme court considered the question of primacy of opinion of chief justice of india in regard to appointment of supreme court judges and further supreme court emphasized that government does not enjoy primacy or absolute discretion in the matters of appointment of supreme court judges the court also said that the provision of consultation with chief justice was introduced as chief justice of india is best equipped to know and assess the worth and suitability of candidate and it was also necessary to eliminate the political influence and it was done to make the process fair and transparent and the selection should be made on participatory consultative process where executive has power to act as a mere check on the exercise of power of chief justice of india to achieve constitutional purpose finally supreme court held that the proposal for appointment of supreme court judge must be initiated by chief justice of india and the last case in this regard is the third judges case which led to the emergence of collegium system in india supreme court has laid down the following provisions for the appointment of supreme court judges and the first one says the chief justice of india shall consult four senior most judges of supreme court while making recommendation for the appointment of supreme court judge and the opinion of all members of collegium shall be in writing and the views of senior most supreme court judge who hails from the high court from where a person recommended comes must be obtained in writing for collegium consideration and it also said if majority of collegium is against the appointment that person shall not be appointed and even if two judges have reservations against the appointment cgi would not press for such appointment and finally a high court judge of outstanding merit can be appointed as supreme court judge regardless of his standing in the seniority list so there is no provision regarding the seniority list for the appointment of supreme court judge now we will solve this prelims mcq which came in the year 2019 it is related to the impeachment of judges of supreme court the first statement says the motion to impeach a judge of supreme court cannot be rejected by speaker of lok sabha as per the judges inquiry act it is an incorrect statement because as per the judges inquiry act speaker may admit or refuse the motion for the impeachment of judge if we eliminate option 1 then we will left with option b and c that means option 3 is correct and the second statement says the constitution of india defines and gives details of what constitutes incapacity and proved misbehavior of judges of supreme court of india it is again an incorrect statement because constitution does not define the incapacity and proved misbehavior of judges and the third statement says the details of the process of impeachment of judges of supreme court are given in judges inquiry act 1968 it is a correct statement the fourth statement says if the motion for the impeachment of judge is taken up for voting the law requires the motion to be backed by each house of the parliament and supported by majority of total membership of that house by not less than 2/3 of the total members of that house present and voting it is a correct statement because the motion for impeachment of judge must be supported by a special majority of each house of parliament which includes the majority of the total membership of that house and a majority of not less than 2/3 of the members present and voting statement 3 and 4 are correct the answer to this question becomes c which is 3 and 4 and a quick recap to our discussion first of all we have discussed the context and its relevance for general studies paper 2 and for prelims exam we have seen the previous year mains question and we discussed one prelims mcq the appointment of judges we also discussed the qualifications required to become judge of supreme court what is collegium the first judges case 
सेकेंड जजेस केस एंड द थर्ड जजेस केस विच लेड टू द इमरजेंस ऑफ कोलिजियम सिस्टम इन इंडिया मूविंग ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट आर्टिकल ऑफ टूडेज डिस्कशन विच इज बेस्ड ऑन दिस न्यूज विच फीचर्ड ऑन पेज नंबर फोर्टीन इन द हिंदू इट बेसिकली टॉक्स अबाउट एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन विच इज द नेशनल ह्यूमन राइट्स कमीशन एंड द कॉन्टेक्सट इज दैट एन एच आर सी हैज टेकन सो मोटो कॉग्निशेंस ऑफ अ मीडिया रिपोर्ट दैट साइटेड अ थ्री हंड्रेड परसेंट इंक्रीज इन द सर्कुलेशन ऑफ चाइल्ड अब्यूज मटीरियल ऑन सोशल मीडिया इन इंडिया एंड द एन एच आर सी हैज सेट दैट द कंटेंट इज ऑफ फॉरन ओरिजिन एंड इंडियन इन्वेस्टिगेशन एजेंसीज हैव नॉट कम अक्रॉस एनी इंडियन मेड चाइल्ड अब्यूज मटीरियल सो फार स्टेचुटरी बॉडीज लाइक एन एच आर सी आर इम्पॉर्टेंट फॉर यू पी एस सी सिविल सर्विसेज एग्जाम इट कम्स अंडर जनरल स्टडीज पेपर टू वेयर स्टेचुटरी रेगुलेटरी एंड क्वासी जुडिशल बॉडीज आर मैंशनड एंड यू पी एस सी हैज ऑल्सो आस्क क्वेश्चन रिलेटेड टू एन एच आर सी इन मेन्स एग्जाम इन टू थाउजेंड फोर्टीन अ क्वेश्चन हैज बीन आस्क ऑन द असेसमेंट ऑफ द रोल ऑफ एन एच आर सी एंड इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन यू पी एस सी आस्क अबाउट द स्ट्रक्चरल एंड प्रैक्टिकल लिमिटेशन ऑफ एन एच आर सी एंड यू आर ऑल्सो रिक्वायर्ड टू सजेस्ट द रेमिडियल मेजर्स फ्रॉम दीज टू क्वेश्चन इट इज क्वाइट क्लियर दैट एन एच आर इज एन इम्पॉर्टेंट एरिया फॉर डिस्कशन द डिस्कशन प्रिमाइस ऑफ दिस टॉपिक फर्स्टली वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट एन एच आर सी इट्स कॉम्पोजिशन द फंक्शंस एंड द इशूज एंड चैलेंजेस विच आर इम्पैक्टिंग द वर्किंग ऑफ एन एच आर सी फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट एन एच आर सी द नेशनल ह्यूमन राइट्स कमीशन ऑफ इंडिया वॉज एस्टेब्लिश्ड इन under the protection of human rights act of 1993 it was established in conformity with the paris principles which are adopted at the first international workshop on national institutions for promotion and protection of human rights and they were also endorsed by general assembly of united nations nhrc plays an important role in promotion and protection of human rights in india further the section 2 Clause 1 sub clause D of Prevention of Human Rights Act defines the human rights as the rights relating to life liberty equality and dignity of an individual which are guaranteed by the constitution and enforceable by the courts in India this was the basic details about the National Human Rights Commission now we will see the composition of National Human Rights Commission the commission is a multi member body consisting of chairperson and five other members and the chairperson should be the retired chief justice of india or the judge of supreme court this particular provision was added by the amendment to the protection of human rights act and before that only chief justice of india was eligible to become the chairperson of nhrc and the other members should be serving or retired judge of supreme court or a serving or retired chief justice of high court and three persons out of which at least one should be women having a knowledge or practical experience with respect to human rights just try to remember this piece of information as there should be at least one women among the members and in addition to these full time members the commission also has seven ex officio members which are the chair persons of national commission of minorities National Commission of SC National Commission for STs for women for backward classes and the National Commission of Protection of Child Rights and the Chief Commissioner for Persons with Disabilities so it also has the ex officio members who are the chair persons of these commissions just note down this particular information as it can be helpful for your prelims exam now what is the appointment procedure of the members to NHRC the chairperson and members are appointed by the president of india on the recommendation of six member committee which consists of prime minister as a head of this committee speaker of lok sabha deputy chairman of rajya sabha leader of opposition in both the houses of parliament which is lok sabha and rajya sabha and the central home minister these are the six members which recommend the names to president for the appointment to national human rights commission further a sitting judge of supreme court or a sitting chief justice of high court can be appointed only after the consultation with chief justice of india now we will try to analyze the functions of national human rights commission firstly 
इट इंक्वायर्स ऑन इट्स ओन और ऑन पिटिशन प्रेजेंटेड टू इट बाय अ विक्टिम और एनी पर्सन ऑन हिज बिहाफ इन टू द कंप्लेंट ऑफ वायलेशन ऑफ ह्यूमन राइट्स और नेग्लिजेंस इन प्रिवेंशन ऑफ सच वायलेशन बाय अ पब्लिक सर्वेंट एन एच आर सी कैन इंटरवीन इन एनी प्रोसीडिंग्स इन्वॉल्विंग वायलेशन ऑफ ह्यूमन राइट्स पेंडिंग बिफोर अ कोर्ट विद द अप्रूवल ऑफ सच कोर्ट हैंस अप्रूवल ऑफ दैट पर्टिकुलर कोर्ट इज रिक्वायर्ड एंड द थर्ड वन इज द मेंबर्स ऑफ एन एच आर सी कैन विजिट एनी जेल और इंस्टीट्यूशन अंडर द कंट्रोल ऑफ स्टेट गवर्नमेंट वेयर पर्सन आर डिटेन और लॉज फॉर द पर्पज ऑफ ट्रीटमेंट रिफॉर्मेशन और प्रोटेक्शन टू स्टडी द लिविंग कंडीशन ऑफ इनमेट्स एंड इट कैन बी डन बाय इंटीमेटिंग टू द कंसर्न स्टेट गवर्नमेंट एंड द नेक्स्ट वन इज इट कैन रिव्यू द सेफ गार्ड अंडर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन और एनी लॉ फॉर द प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ ह्यूमन राइट्स एंड रिकमेंड मेजर्स फॉर देयर इफेक्टिव इम्प्लीमेंटेशन फर्दर एन एच आर सी कैन रिव्यू द फैक्टर्स इंक्लूडिंग द एक्ट्स ऑफ टेररिज्म दैट इनहिबिट द इंजॉयमेंट ऑफ ह्यूमन राइट्स एंड रिकमेंड अप्रोप्रिएट रेमिडियल मेजर्स इन द लास्ट वन इज इट कैन स्टडी द ट्रीटीज एंड अदर इंटरनेशनल इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स ऑन ह्यूमन राइट्स एंड मेक रिकमेंडेशन फॉर देयर इफेक्टिव इम्प्लीमेंटेशन and from this discussion we get to know that nhrc can only give recommendations and due to that in june 2016 the former chief justice of india hl dattu described this institution as toothless tiger now we will discuss the issues and challenges with this particular commission the first one is related to autonomy of national human rights commission although the commission is supposed to be completely independent in its functioning there are provisions in the act which underscore the dependence of commission on government for instance section 11 of the protection of human rights act makes the commission dependent on government for its manpower requirements further the section 32 makes the commission financially dependent on center government hence the commission is dependent for its manpower and finances on center government which curtails its autonomy the next one is lacks enforcing powers nhrc does not have any backing of protection of human rights act to penalize the authorities which do not implement its orders which makes the nhrc's recommendations impossible to reach at the ground level further the act does not categorically empower nhrc to act when human rights violation through private parties take place so the commission does not have enforcing powers it is an important issue with respect to nhrc the third one is it lacks expertise although the act requires that three of the five members of human rights commission must be former judges but it does not specify whether these judges should have a proven record of human rights activism or expertise or qualifications in that area moreover the human rights commission primarily draw their staff from government departments mainly from bureaucracy and due to the bureaucratic style of functioning the strict hierarchies are maintained which often makes it difficult for victims to obtain documents or information about the status of their case and the next one is delay in disposal of cases although the expectation from the commission was to keep a tight grip on the disposal of cases but it did not happen and the number of pending cases has increased year by year and as of now more than 10000 cases which are related to human rights violation are pending before the commission the next one is shortage of manpower most of the officers who are working with the commission are either on deputation or reemployed after retirement which makes the commission understaffed because the people who are working here on deputation will be called back to their parent department after a certain period of time the next one is low awareness both at the level of general population and the law enforcers which is the police department during the training of police force a very little time was given to develop the forensic skills and human right awareness which further creates problem in doing justice and the next one is delay in publication of reports the delay in publication of annual reports by 2 or 3 years has been a constant problem for the commission if the reports are not published on time then the decision which has to be taken in that particular regard will also be delayed and the last one is 
constrained against armed forces since a very large number of complaints of human rights violation are directed against the members of armed forces and the protection of human rights act obviously weakens nhrc's effectiveness in providing relief to general public in such cases moreover the section 19 of protection of human rights act the commission can only call for reports from central government in cases which involves the members of armed forces and then make recommendations to the government and there is no power given to the commission to enforce its decisions further preventing nhrc from independently investigating complaints against the military and security forces not only compounds the problem but also furthers impunity so nhrc has to develop a strong image as a protector of poor marginalized and vulnerable sections but that will not be possible without substantial changes in the legal framework itself which demands for a systemic reforms before concluding this discussion what can be the way forward to improve the effectiveness of nhrc the first one is independence and autonomy there is a need for legal reforms to enhance the independence of nhrc ensuring that it operates with complete autonomy from government and other external entities the next one is adequate resource and capacity allocating adequate resource to the commission both in terms of budget and skilled personnel is essential to enable it to fulfill its mandate effectively the third one is increase awareness and accessibility enhancing public awareness through campaigns and improving the accessibility through digital platforms regional offices will help in ensuring that individuals have better access to justice and can effectively report human rights violation the fourth one is speedy and effective redressal mechanism establishing specialized courts or fast track courts dedicated to human rights cases can significantly reduce the backlog and ensure the speedy resolution and the last one is collaboration and partnership nhrc should actively collaborate with civil society organizations ngos and other stakeholders who are working on human rights issues such collaborations can contribute to nhrc's effort in monitoring advocating and resolving the human rights violation by writing these points you can conclude your answer in respect of nhrc a quick recap to our discussion first of all we have discussed the context and its relevance for the general studies paper 2 we have seen the main questions the basics about nhrc its composition the appointment of members the functions of nhrc issues and challenges which are impacting the working of nhrc and finally a way forward to improve the effectiveness of nhrc that's all for today's discussion thank you for watching today's dns stay tuned for upcoming sessions which will improve and enhance your preparation for the mains exam